Today we celebrate the feast day of St. Photios the Great, the Patriarch of Constantinople. St. Photios the Great is known for and revered for many things. He was a man of the highest learning of his age, both sacred and secular. He was a theologian and a bishop who was one who sought to grow the church in the many missionary activities that he sent out. However, history perhaps best knows him or thinks of him in terms of the conflict with which he entered into the West. St. Photios of Constantinople was one of the first, but the one who definitively condemned that Western heresy of the Filioque. For those of us who perhaps are unaware, the Filioque was an addition to the creed, an addition of a single word in reference to the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed that we know and we say in the Orthodox Church states that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Latin filioque and the Son was added in the West. Many people, especially in this day and age, question the significance of this. Because this indeed was something that is at the root of the schism between East and West. They say perhaps it's just a matter of semantics or philosophy. And yet St. Photios recognized an important truth, one that I again and again try to reiterate. Theology and life cannot be separated. Theology without life is a theology of the intellect, of the mind, of intellectual exercises. And life without theology is a life without foundation, a life without direction, a life ultimately without hope. Life will always be affected by theology and our lives will be affected by our theology. And so we can look today at three great consequences of this filioque. Three consequences that St. Photios the Great sought to prevent. These are uh, three isms. Historicism, moralism, and sentimentalism. You see, the filioque began to diminish the importance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit became not so much a uh, hypostasis, a person of this Trinitarian communion, but became like this energy or this relationship between the Father and the Son. And so as the Holy Spirit became diminished, we see these three consequences, these three, I would go as far as to say heresies, begin to rise in the West. And sadly, to some degree, we've even been infected by them in the Orthodox Church. Historicism. Because of this diminishing of the Holy Spirit, uh, emphasis began to be placed on the past. And this, of course, had many consequences, some of which we find in the Reformation. Sola Scriptura. Because our relationship with God is ultimately through these past events, the best we can do is reflect on them. Turn to that time period and the words that were written when these events occurred. And so we have a sola scripture. We have a faith alone. Because some in this day, 2,000 years, separate us from the events of the New Testament, they're so far removed from us. And so for many, salvation Life is one that's merely one of belief, believing in these past events. This has even affected 
the area of art, we see that this historicism is found in the art of the modern media because of this removal, this distance in time between us today and these events of the New Testament, people seek to have some sort of encounter, asking themselves, if only I could have been alive back then and seen Christ in these miracles that St. Paul worked. And so we have things like the Passion of the Christ, these Jesus Christ movies where people can somehow insert themselves mechanistically into these historical events. But for us in the Orthodox Church, this is not the case. Because the Holy Spirit is so central and present in our lives, these events are not separated from us by time. And we see this and we experience this in the hymns. We say, today the virgin gives birth. Today, now, he who suspended the earth amidst the waters is hung upon the tree. The significance, the grace, the power of that event is made present here and now for us by the Holy Spirit. The, holy, the whole orientation of Christianity that gives its due to the Holy Spirit is one that's oriented to the kingdom of God, not these past events. And so for us, the liturgy is not so much a reenactment of a historical event, but the realization and the coming of the kingdom of God and Christ himself by the Holy Spirit who reveals to us the Father. The second of these consequences of this diminishment of the Holy Spirit is a moralism. If we are removed from the reality and the presence of Christ, what can we do but imitate him? And this again goes back to this central and uh, isolating focus on just the scriptures. I can imitate Christ. I can imitate the apostles. In fact, one of the, the great classics of Western spirituality is titled on the imitation of Christ. And what does this lead to? This leads to, in a sense, a truth for the sake of virtue. It no longer is about the truth as a living person that we can encounter as much as somehow following this truth that we might be good. And this has very much shaped our whole modern soteriology where it's really about being good. How many times I've heard someone say, oh, this person's not a Christian, but Father, they're a really good person. This person didn't live the life of the church, but they were a good person. Because in the mind of today, what matters is just being good. But this, my friends, is not only problematic, but it's truly tragic. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are, your end will be the same as the bad person. There's a danger here in enslaving ourselves to the law, using the law to subject and to beat up others. We're only a step away from Pharisaicism. And yet for us in the Orthodox Church, it's not about being good for the sake of good, but as St. Seraphim of Sarav, who in some ways was a descendant of St. Photios, who sent the missionaries to the Slavs, tells us that the purpose of life is the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. We see this in the title of the book by the great St. Nicholas Kavasilas. It's not on the imitation of Christ, but life in Christ. Because the Holy Spirit makes Christ present here and now and in our lives, we are able to be united to him. United to him, St. Nicholas tells us, in a way that is more intimate and nearer to us than our very bones. Finally, we have the consequences of this diminishment of the Holy Spirit and this sentimentalism. If I cannot be present and stand in the presence of Christ and the saints, 
as did the apostles so long ago, I can at least allow myself to be moved by these experiences. And so we get this emphasis on emotion to the point that it has affected the art. If we look at the history of Western music that until recently was largely one that was ecclesiastical, we see again and again this music trying to shape and to create this emotional space, whether it's the symphonies of classical Europe or the rock ballads of today's megachurch. Even in the architecture, we see this, that Gothic art that sought to show the power of God and to perhaps seeming, when you walk into a Gothic cathedral, you almost feel crushed by the weight. You're in awe, your emotions, and yet we remain distant from the one. But here in the Orthodox Church, the Holy Spirit makes present to us Christ. And so, not that the emotions are somehow removed or not important, but regardless of how we feel, Christ is present in our lives. Perhaps we are being hit by the waves of sorrow, and yet with the Holy Spirit we stand firm because our joy is present within us. The waves of fear, even the happiness we may experience, we are able to keep a sobriety because it's not so much how I feel, but that I am in relation and communion with Christ himself. And finally, we see this in the very architecture. I had spoken of the Gothic architecture, but in the Orthodox Church, we're revealed not so much the distance between God and man, but rather the presence of the divine. That one cannot enter into traditional Orthodox Church without at once feeling that God is present, that the Holy Spirit is present, the Mother of God is present, and all of the saints are present here and now. And finally, in conclusion, sometimes I think people with this sentimentalistic uh, understanding of our church sometimes ask, Father, why do we have so many services throughout the week? Why are you doing a liturgy on a Saturday morning when two beautiful, faithful members, but only two come? Because the Holy Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, we trust and know that as empty as this church may be, it's filled with the saints and the angels made present by the Holy Spirit. That even if it's just Father Gregory and myself and a chanter, that the Holy Spirit comes at the divine liturgy. That the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ. An incarnation takes place and thereby every part of creation, the city of Birmingham, the fields of Alabama, the earth itself is blessed. May Christ our God send upon us and upon his world the Holy Spirit through the prayers of St. Photios.